Here are the highlights of round 12 of the Tartal Steel Tournament. Of course, the penultimate round. Three players shared the lead going into round 12, Anish Giri, Magnus Carlsen and Shahriya Mamadyarov with Anand just half a point behind. Incredibly close. First of all, let's look at uh, Mamadyarov's game. Now, he was playing the English Grandmaster, Galway Jones. It's a Petrov. And Jones selects c4 and then decides to trade the knight. Well, it's maybe not the sharpest line, but it can become tense. g6. Okay, fine. And now bishop g5 from Jones. And here, well, f6 is very ugly. Queen d7 also looks very awkward. So really, black has to play bishop e7. And then Jones put the bishop on h6. Bishop f8. You need to get rid of this bishop. Bishop came back to g5. Uh -oh, we're repeating the position. And, well, Mamadyarov has no real alternative here. And the players repeated the position. Draw. Well, after the game, Mamadyarov was... Well, he was very surprised that Jones had played like this and, well, rather dissatisfied. You know, he wanted to keep at least some tension in the position to have maybe the opportunity to play for a win. And he said he was very surprised that Garwin Jones played for a draw like this. You know, he has the opportunity to play against, well, the number two in the world. And yet he just makes a quick draw like this. And it does seem like a wasted opportunity. So, Mamadyarov disappointed. What about Anand? Let's have a look at his game. Now, Anand was playing against Wesley So. Now, this was an open Spanish. And the players, I mean, both players, of course, very well prepared. And they followed a line. I'm not going to play through the whole thing. Um, this position has been reached before um, between Adams and Geary. This is move 28, and here Adams played rook a8 and chopped the piece rooks off to make a draw. Instead, here Anand played rook d1, but the game also ended in a draw after the trade of rooks and then the trade of queens very quickly. So basically, Anand just happy with the draw, wasn't going to rock the boat, but a little maybe a little bit disappointing you know he could have tried for a win and maybe even gone for you know to gone for first place but obviously content with his results so far he doesn't like to rock the boat too much so that left Anish Giri and Magnus Carlsen still playing now they both had the white pieces first of all let's have a look at Anish Giri's game against Adiban. Now, Adiban played with Fianchetto and, well, they reached uh, this position after move 15 moves. Um, well, you can see that Adiban still has this very nice bishop, but he's yet to develop properly. Um, but also Giri piece is also not fantastic and this pawn on d5 although it gives white space it does block out this bishop on c4. Kiri played bishop g5 now that's a testing move. Black still has, a, has to be a little bit careful here. I mean perhaps bishop f6 is the best idea. Uh, I mean after the trade of bishops then this would certainly be very helpful to black because white is left with this bishop just biting on the pawn and you know these dark squares can be used very nicely for the knights and the queen. Geary said that he was probably going to play h4 here but again this seems well at the very least quite playable for black. Uh, one could also put the bishop back on e3 that's possible but it, it seems as though well, black is, is comfortable here anyway. But after bishop g5, Adiban played knight f6. And then after knight d4, well, as Giri said, now black has a few problems to solve. 
So it's not so easy. White can make use of this space advantage. The point of knight d4 is, or one of the points, is that black can't just develop normally with knight d7 because then comes a very nice move, knight e6. Of course, you don't want to allow a trade here, so the pawn takes. And obviously this lineup of the bishop against the king is, is rather uncomfortable. The discovered check threatened here. So d5 is a very nice peace sacrifice here. Check. And then rook d1. And, well, white has two pawns for the piece and just massive compensation with his pawn on d7. I imagine this is just winning for white, actually. So that's a little bit scary, having this knight floating around, but I mean, possibly a6 is a good move here, just to keep that knight later out of b5. But, you know, it's it's not much fun to, to wait around. You know, Adiban wants to complete his development, and you know, a6 is maybe just a bit too cool for school. Um, he played queen b6 after, after some time. But after bishop e3, now he's getting chased around, and this is uncomfortable. So if the queen goes backwards, then queen b3. You can see white is basically just better developed here and using the space advantage, and this is very uncomfortable. Of course, you don't want to play b6 and you know allow a knight into c6, for example. So after bishop e3, Aliban played knight g4. Okay, starting to get a little bit tricky, of course, if that's taken, then bishop takes knight, but queen e4 is uncomfortable. And if knight takes bishop, then queen e8 check, bishop comes back, and nasty, very nasty for black. You can see this pin is really annoying, and the rook can come to f1. So after queen e4, Ariban puts the knight back on f6. Remember, he's also got to contend with a potential uh, discovered attack here. Queen e7, this is getting nasty already. And knight b5, discovered attack. And also looking at the deep wall. Now, Ariban played bishop f8, but after the queen was well the queens are exchanged then this is basically just a clear extra pawn now there's still still some some hard work to go but well giri is really in his element in this kind of position because not only does he have an extra pawn but he has space that's always the problem with these kind of king's indian or bononi setups that you know, if things turn against you, then your opponent can use the space with a pawn on d5. This pawn on d6 is still very weak. So an extra pawn and also a very nice positional advantage too. And Giri made certain. He, he played very well indeed. So for the moment, just holding everything. But this one isn't running away. You know, black is basically very passive here. And now the rook turns towards the attack. Of course, black could go backwards here, but um, I mean, in the long run, I think black is basically just lost here. Adiban played actively with rook a4, but the, the attack on, on the eighth rank is just way too strong. And after f4, this is really nasty. Okay, at the moment material is is even, but you know th this is this is really a deadly attack. That the king, I'm afraid, cannot escape here. So that d pawn drops, and there's there's more to come. Check. If knight f4, then the bishop just nudges back, attacking this one and then coming in here. Well, that the knight will defend on g7, but uh, after knight b7, these pawns are too strong. 
knight of two played. Well, this is a vain hope. Bishop g5 looking to come in here. Aliban looking to set up some kind of mating net, but g4 just gets out of trouble. And now white is a piece up. If uh, king takes bishop, then rook takes f7, followed by g5 and rook h7 mate. So in this position, knight d3. This is the game continuation. Once again, this leads to checkmate. So after rook f7, the, the king went back. Well, of course, white is just a piece up now. And in this position, uh, yeah, the king is also in, in a mating net. Here, Aliban resigned. Well, white can either play knight f7 here or g5. Both moves keep black's king in the box. So actually, after a, not such a great opening, um, Giri won that game really convincingly. He basically just outplayed Adiban. So that meant Giri uh, took a convincing lead. Magnus could match him if he won his game against Matlokov. So let's just take a look at this. Um, they reached this position out of the opening. And, well, <laughs> this is really hard work for white. Even material, opposite colour bishops. Um, we're in an end game. Magnus likes endings with opposite colour bishops. The one thing about that is that it's very hard for the defender to simplify when there are opposite colour bishops. Um, Magnus wouldn't have been very happy with this position. He would have hoped for more out of the opening. But he's got a little something. He can still keep trying. So, for example, after bishop e6, holding this pawn, then rook d1. And you can see that black basically is passive here. Black will have to wait. Is this enough? to draw, it's very hard to say. Um, I mean, it, it's funny, this, this position reminds me very much of the position that Magnus got against Wesley So, but if you if you mirror the position <laughs> along the middle, um, remember there was a bishop on g6, it's, it's really similar, and, and the king somewhat boxed in, this time on b8 instead of uh, g8 or, or h8. Um, it's incredible. Now, could black hold this position just by defending passively? It's very hard to say. Matlakov decided not to risk it. The problem is if you sit there like a lemon and get outplayed, um, then you look pretty foolish. He decided to play more actively. This is always the dilemma in these technical positions. Do you give up material and play more actively? Do you sit there and play passively? Really hard to know. Madlakov played rook e6 and gave up the c-pawn. Well, this is not hardly fatal. His idea is that at least in this position he can trade a pair of rooks, because of course, well, this bishop is on, and if the rook comes here, then you can take a pawn. So Magnus has to trade rooks. But that doesn't completely free black from the bind, because the the white the black rook can't move away from defending the d8 square. So again, another situation where black could conceivably remain passive, play something like this and just wait and see what happens. Very hard to know if white can win that one. Of course, you know, you can advance pawns and the king, maybe, maybe the king could somehow, you know, find its way to the king side, I don't know. Um, but, Madlakov decided not to risk that and instead took on g2. So Magnus comes in with the rook, regains his extra pawn, and the rook is blocked in. But actually, well, it's always going to be possible to free that rook. So Magnus plays a4, of course, he wants to lock the bishop in here. It's always going to be possible to free the rook either with f5 uh, or h5. King b2, a little improvement to the position, and now Magnus decides this is the time to free the rook. 
So that gets taken and bishop c5. So you can see the rook is attacked, has to move away, and the rook is out. But, well, going into this, Matlakov must have thought, well, at least his, his rook and the king have some freedom. And this extra pawn here doesn't look that scary. You know, it's doubled. Nevertheless, I mean, this is quite extraordinary how Magnus manages to keep making progress in this position. Um, so you can see this B pawn is under fire. Not so easy to defend it. You know, if, if the bishop could, could sit on E4 and defend both pawns, that would be fine. But the rook magically controls this key square. So A5. Of course, that can't be captured because the king takes the rook. So the bishop goes back. And rook C4. So they, they're trading off pawns here. Still looks very dry. But after this, this is uncomfortable because... Now, well, for example, after h5, then bishop b4 wins this a pawn. So Matlakov played rook e4, escaping with the rook, giving that pawn, but at least capturing the pawn on c2. But now Magnus has an extra pawn, a clear extra pawn. And he's also managed to bring his bishop so this key square defending the pawn on h2, but also the bishop in turn will be defended by his passed pawn. And luckily for Magnus, there's no uh, good discovered check in this position. Of course, if, if the bishop checks, then the king will just come up to defend the pawn. And this is a very unpleasant position to defend. So it's incredible how little by little Magnus has made something of this position. Now, is this position a win? Well, we're getting much, much closer to the edge now because basically white can just play with his king and rook. You can see that the pawn and bishop, the pawns and the bishop are completely cemented. So white can just dance around with the king and rook uh, to get that breakthrough, to, to force that pawn through. And that's what Magnus managed to do. It is quite extraordinary how he managed to squeeze blood from a stone in this position. Um, the king making good progress and now, well, I think the king should really move back um, to f5 to maybe try and defend, but it's, it's really difficult. But instead, the king went to the h-file, and this really is horrible now. Um, I think this is just lost, actually, because the king is so badly placed. So let's just go to the end. And in this position, Matlakov resigned. There's really nothing that black can do. The king is going to shuffle over and the pawn will advance. Of course, you can give up bishop for pawn, but well, that, that position with an extra piece for white is absolutely hopeless. So an incredible performance from Magnus to, to make something of that. So that leaves, well, let's just recap the the size of games so Giri defeated Ariban, Carlson defeated Matlakov and Kramnik defeated Caruana in a very nice technical game so that means uh, going into the final round round 13 the leading scores are Giri and Carlson with eight and a half Mamadyarov on eight Kramnik and Anand on seven and a half uh, last round pairings Giri has black against Wei Yi. Carlson has black against Karyakin. Well, Carlson has a much harder task than Giri. Uh, uh, Mamadyarov plays Anand. Not easy. And Kramnik has black against Adiban. Anything could happen in that last round. I mean, if I were to predict, I would say that Giri and Carlson might well draw, but they, ha they have the black pieces. If there's a tie for first place, then there will be some kind of tie break um, will take place. But unfortunately, there were no details on the official site, so I don't know what kind of tie break. But anyway, 
Round 13 is going to be incredible. I mean, conceivably, it's still possible for five players to win this tournament. So stay tuned, folks. It's going to be an amazing last round.